So th thank you, Simon. Uh, thank you, Jakub, and everybody who has been uh, participating on making this happen. Uh, my talk is the three stages of immersing your students in literature. The key here is immersion, immersing, because as we all know, the best thing uh, how to learn a foreign language is to actually move to the foreign uh, land. The next best thing is to, uh, uh, to socialize very frequently with someone, either with friends, partner, whatever. And the next best thing uh, might be to watch books and movies, is if we are now disregarding language schools. And books and movies, because they give the real taste of, of, of the language, of the mindset, because language is a manifestation of a different mindset. So through that, I believe that it's very useful and fun to explore that. And the literature bit, like more accurate would be to say uh, idiomatic, texts, because not everything I will be mentioning is proper literature with a capital L, like uh, Faulkner and stuff, because you can't really bring like Finnegan's Wake to an A1 course, it would be a little bit overwhelming. So some of it will be just quotes, uh, like little texts or toasts or something like that. Yeah. I would like to start with prerequisites, like what is really, really important to think about before you would do this before if, if you have been thinking about it. So this would be the filter. Uh, to, yeah, they're interested. It's very, very important. Like it's great that you are very passionate about literature. It's great. You should you should uh, read often, but not everybody is. And some uh, some of your students might be like very technical minded or something like that. So they might not enjoy that much. So before you would actually decide to involve uh, some literary text or even articles, something like that, uh, into your lesson, make sure that uh, they, they will be interested. Which can be, for example, uh, achieved by when you are introducing, uh, uh, making the introductory lesson, just ask them uh, how do they feel about the books, what are their favorite authors, genres, what are their favorite topics, and from that I always like uh, note it down, so that I can see if in this course, potentially, in the future, I might use it. So it's very good to just ask them. Do you like books? What kind of books? Appropriate complexity, idiomaticity of the text. Yeah, this is very, very important. As I've mentioned, the example with Finnegan's Wake, which might not be a very good example in, in, this, uh, in this context. So just make sure that your students will be able to understand. It's, very, it's probably the most important thing that I'm here now, uh, uh, that's, that th this thing is supposed to tell you. Students are interesting, again, it's very important. The rhythm of the lesson allows it, because as, as we all know, in, in, uh, in reality, many of the lessons are very rushed. The students come in very stressed, or they have to leave midway because of the, their bo boss is calling, or something comes up. So this, the, the, the involving literature in your lessons is kind of a luxury, even. It's not the main thing, really. It's rather a luxury. So you have to make sure that the lesson allows it, that the, that you know that the student will not be called away mid-lesson, that the student is like prepared mentally for this, or you can prepare them through warm-up exercises, and that it just fits. And now, before I, I will actually delve into the specifics, I would uh, like to talk about why even to do it. Why is it so good? Literex provides opportunities for multisensorial classroom. This means, for example, combining it also with some uh, movies that you can first uh, read an excerpt from Great Gatsby, for example, and following that uh, with uh, part of the movie, I either the original good one or the shitty one with uh, Di DiCaprio. And you can, uh, again, surround the text, surround the text with lots of activities. Speaking, listening, reading, writing. Speaking, of course, before you read it, you discuss the text, you discuss the author, you discuss the context of the text, and uh, listening, of course, if the uh, colleagues, if the other students are reading the text, or if you are reading the text, so that you can uh, practice pronunciation, which is very good to do, for example, with uh, quotes and uh, toasts, because they are very rhythmical, very emphatic. Reading, of course, obviously, and writing, which would be the uh, most desirable follow-up exercise. Writing, just write an essay, what did you like? 
what did you like about this article, about this quote, about this uh, post, about this short story, about this chapter from a novel? Write what you, which characters you enjoyed, with which characters did you emphasize, with which characters did you relate, which characters you hated. You know, go after these main like feelings, passions. What did you hate about it? What did you love about it? How how would you rewrite it? Did you like the ending? Would you prefer a different ending? So write it. It's sometimes they really enjoy to uh, rewrite the ending, for example, of some of, of some uh, story of some episode which they didn't really like how how they, how it ended. And of course, exemplifying grammatical structures on an idiomatic text, you, you can beautifully illustrate it. You can play with it. It's it's like it, it, it's very. It's hard to exhaust it. It's hard to exhaust it. If if you have a pro proper juicy text, article, short story, you can uh, do the main thing, reading, then writing. You can use it just to show, to illustrate the grammatical phenomenon that you are now uh, that you are now going through with your, with your students. And of course, there's always new vocab. There's always new vocab. And uh, as we all know, it's much preferable to see the new vocab in context. I always try to, I always uh, tell my students to not really write like simple single words into their notebooks, but in the whole phrase, because it's it's it, the glue. The glue is much better, and you can see the usage. And, and this is all about usage. This is all about usage to actually see how the language is actually used, how it is actually spoken. Yeah, and this is the more uh, uh, this is more idealistic. This is a little bit idealistic that that that. That of course, uh, uh, literature is great because uh, you can see how other people are experiencing life. So you can develop understanding of other people, of other cultures, of other genders, of just pe people in different circumstances. So ideally, it would develop tolerance and understanding. But this, uh, you know, it, it depends what you're using and how. Uh, how long, uh, uh, how long standing is this exercise, and how deeply you delve into it, and this is very important. What I just why I prefer it because in textbooks you always get a sanitized uh, world, of course books. So we through literature, through excerpts from movies, you show the dirt of the world, you show how uh, life is actually lived. Of course, you don't have to go like too much like to war. To not not to be like too 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 dark, of course, but just to show uh, just a normal dialogue, just a normal dialogue from from a short story, from a movie, whatever. It's just much preferable and shows the actual use of the language much better than a course book. But again, I remind this is more of a luxury in the class. It shouldn't be like the sole focus, unless the student like really really wants something like that. Yeah, this is a little bit of a theory. We don't really need it. Just, just you know, just the basic stuff that referential language, uh, which is normally normally appears somewhere in some court books or whatever, is one-dimensional, and literary language is multi-dimensional. That both emotions and cognitive faculties are uh, activated, actuated, which is very important for uh, remembering. If, if they have strong feelings during reading the texts, it's more likely that they will remember. The phrases, the collocations, which is all, all we are about. Imagination help empathy again, a little bit idealistic, but it's uh, it's great to mention that and develop their own creativity. So now, stage one, because again, you cannot use uh, Moby Dick for A ones. So for A ones, A two, it would be toasts, quotes, and very short poems. This does not require too much preparation, and it can be like sprinkled into the class nearly everywhere. It can be used for a warm-up, for example. You can bring an interesting quote, which is somehow relevant. You know, you know, it is very good for a warm-up or for developing some ma main theme. For example, I will then show some uh, examples from when I did a St. Patrick's Day class uh, in, 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 with some students. And yeah, afterwards. And I would begin with just discussing what is St. Patrick, what do they know about it, with what color is it associated, from which country uh, it comes from, who is St. Patrick, why did the Druids, Druids be beat him up and dislike him, and so on. 
and then I would in that class uh, show a video about St. Patrick to have some visual cue and then I would follow that with some Irish uh, drinking toasts and very short poems about leprechauns, shamrock and, and this. N nobody knew what was shamrock, leprechaun, so that was the usual vocab that we learned. And here are some of the examples of what I brought to the class. For example, this uh, lovely Irish toast. I'll have what the gentleman on the floor is having. <laughs> Everybody loves that. <laughs> Everybody loves that. So, so you, it's a very vivid. You can, you can imagine it. It's very relatable for Czech people, especially for Czech people. It's very relatable. And it's great that you can write here that you, they will know how simple it is to order something. That instead of, say, a beer, I'll have a beer. And it's just much more idiomatic and you can already like start uh, use that, because make sure that there is always something, something useful, something idiomatic that they usually don't come across. So here, for example, it would be this phrase, I'll have, I'll have a beer, I'll have a bottle, I have, I'll have whatever. And it's just very, very uh, useful for uh, speaking. Then a bird with one wing can't fly, said to encourage someone to take a second drink which is again very relatable for, for Czech people because we have the idiom uh, to, to, to the other like, uh, like i do druhý nohy, something like that. So, so, so it's always good to show the, the idioms, the same idioms that they, that the students often use so that they know how to use them in, uh, in English. And then the third example, may you live as long as you want and never want as long as you live which is a slightly more complex, uh, so it, this would be like more A2, B1 maybe, B, and it like, uh, nicely shows the other, not, not that commonly known, uh, meaning of want, to like. So th this is a nice way to illustrate th this, this meaning. So th these are just the bits, bits that you can, uh, that does not require too much preparation, you can use them uh, at uh, basically all parts, segments of the lesson. You can close with it, you can open with it. And some follow-up exercises that actually worked was uh, I taught the students to remember one or two of their favorite uh, toasts or sayings or proverbs and to say it as if they were in a pub. And, and so this is also very good to act it out. Act it out as well and they will uh, remember it all the more. I'll have what the gentleman on the floor is having, instead of I'll have what the gentleman on the floor is having. So, so just, just to ma make it alive, make the language alive. That's what I like about uh, and, uh, idiomatic texts, like not really literature, later on literature, but idiomatic, vivid texts that make sure that, uh, that you can drink Irishman's health and that you will not uh, risk your own. And then this is like more, this would like require, of course, slightly more time of the lesson, like 10, 10, 15 minutes to first make sure uh, that they know the vocab. For example, we would go, I would bring like a short poem like this or something about leprechaun in that lesson about St. Patrick. And first we would make sure that they know the vocab. Then we would go through it once and then go through it uh, the second time reading it out loud. Again, this is very nice language, so it, it comes alive as, as you read it. It comes alive as you think about the context, the very, very uh, vivid uh, context of, of, of Ireland, of St. Patrick. And so this is very good for training uh, pronunciation, pronunciation definitely, and uh, collocations and all. Then, stage two. Here we would move rather to B ones and all. Because for A1s, A2s, rather very short poems, uh, quotes, toasts, depends on you, on, on what you're interested in, what the students are interested in, what is the holiday that is coming up. It's always good to, uh, to, to connect it with something that is very current or bring some politicians, quote, whatever. And then stage two, where we would have poems of varying complexity, so something more like a page, page long, short stories, short chapters from a novel, articles. And this uh, requires preparation, and this has to be uh, pre-planned, of course, and you have to devote like at least uh, half of the lesson to this. May maybe even whole, it, it depends. It depends on you, on how long the text is, how complex it is, 
And so you definitely need uh, preparation at, at this stage. You def sometimes even to uh, give it them to uh, read it at home first, which is very good for them to get acquainted with the text so that it's not like absolute just, just sink or swim. So get acquainted with it, t give them the short story before you read it in class. Uh, tell them to note new vocab, then clear that before you actually start reading on the, uh, on the following class, and then uh, devote like at least half a lesson to it. Like make sure again that the text uh, is appropriate. Of course, politically, uh, better is apolitical. The animal, anim animals, anything but animals is always great because they're rather apolitical, and. Yes, ma ma make sure that they will not be lost, that they will not be, it will, it will be not overwhelming. Because that, that's just, you know, you, you would make it just n n not nice. So, so make sure it's appropriate, make sure it's not overwhelming. And then I, for example, brought this uh, short story after I was thrown into the river and before I drowned. It sounds much more dark than it is, it's, it's very fun. It's told from a perspective of a dog, which is great because it has simple, vivid language. He is like, I love running, I love to run, I, I, I'm faster than the light. And it's like this kind of language, so it's very vivid, very simple and idiomatic at the same time. And the dog even at some point says, uh, damn, and everybody loves to say, damn, damn. So, so did this kind of idiomaticity, which is not too vulgar, but like appears. Yes, if you take, uh, if you watch any, any movie, there will be, Damn, for sure. So, so it is, it's, it's important that they know what it means. But not, of course, to over-focus on, 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 on these, on these aspects. And ma make sure just it's, it will be fun. And uh, I did this in, in many classes, did this short story in particular and some others as well. And, uh, uh, what is most important is really to make sure that the class is appropriate for it, that you will have time and focus and uh, give it to them pre-class so that they can get acquainted with it. And again, you can follow it up uh, with these longer ones, usually with a debate. And uh, just the, the best case scenario is that you will end up debating the short story for the rest of the class passionately. It's great. It doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes it happens. It's great. So the best is, of course, a debate, like well, what, what did it did mean, what did you think about it, uh, is it too weird that it's from the perspective of a dog, do you think it's, it's, it's authentic that a dog would write like this, a dog, dog would think like this, whatever. And again, vocab, discuss vocab, what was new, what, was, what needs to be more discussed more, just make sure that, that they can like, ask a lot of questions afterwards, like what did you think about it? Is it, is it clear which, which parts were not clear and then you can spend the rest of the lesson focusing on some gram grammatical phenomenon or some passage, just making sure that they understand the text. Just comprehending the text, usually you spend the rest of the lesson with it. And then it depends on their enthusiasm, uh, if, if they want to do something more with the text, like again, writing something about it. Usually an essay, like, uh, who was my favorite character? whom I hated, uh, which, which different end would I prefer, so write the, the different ending, and just get them involved, if they are interested. Make sure that they are interested. And then, stage three, which is like very similar to the stage two, just that there are longer stuff, more complex stuff, and even you may end up uh, like reading a whole novel with somebody, like in the course of the whole course, for example, if somebody is like very, very high up, like C1, C2, so then it's very, very, the best way how to improve you even further is to read a book, to get acquainted with the idiomaticity, with, uh, collocations that might not, uh, like not everyday collocations, because at this level they already know the everyday collocations, so they want more. So at this level, C1, or maybe B2 maybe, they, they want to, it's, definitely appropriate to give them something uh, more uh, heavier. And there can be longer short stories, more complex poems, novels even, like uh, usually a chapter chapter per lesson, or even like you can assign them a home reading, if that is appropriate, if they have time for it, if they are interested in it. It's like, it, it depends on the student, because sometimes like they don't even have time to go through the Quizlet vocab, so it's not, not ideal to assign them home reading. 
but sometimes that they, they are really into it. So if they are, seize it. Seize it and assign something that they know they will be interested in. And this uh, stretches over more than one lesson. Substantial preparation definitely and follow-up exercises. So this is like very individual. This this is more fitting for individual lessons when you can like properly delve into it and <coughs> answer all, all the all the students' uh, pos possible <coughs> questions. I've done this uh, the the. Uh, the, the least amount of this I've done, of course, because most of my students are A2 or B, B2. But I've had like three or four students with, with whom we, we got to this level. And with one student, we are now reading some to Tom Clancy novel. He's very into like action and thrillers, detectives and uh, agents. So it's very, very, very vivid and nice for him. And he's learning a lot of new uh, American slang, because at this level, you, you delve into slang. So, so those people who have the luxury to, to delve into this, go for it. But not always, because usually, again, this is a luxury, so usually, of course, the, the, this would be like at the end or something like that. And follow-up exercises. Again, you can, like, with somebody, with a student from Zantiva, I'm reading the Tom, Tom Clancy novel, so uh, he's, uh, he's, like, bringing updates nearly every lesson about what, what he has read and what, we, what, what he has thought about it which is then perfect, because you have something long-standing and he's interested and he's like, he wants to know, of course, it's, it's a readable book, so he wants to know what, what comes next. And, you know, this, uh, I, I did, this is like the highest I ever got with a student because we were translating uh, Kalevala. This is a Finnish epic, not from, from old Finnish, of course, but from the, the, <laughs> the, the, the English translation. And this is the beginning of the, of, of the epic Kalevala and this uh, lady from Zentiva, she was very interested into f folk mythology and just folk songs and everything. And uh, I, I discussed, uh, we, we were like debating a lot, and I mentioned that I've been to Finland and that I, I was reading this, this epic, and she didn't know about it, so she was very interested about the national poem of Finland, so I brought it. She was very excited about it. And she, she then, like, on her own, actually, she started translating it, and then we were, uh, like, uh, discussing it. But again, this is, like, very, like, C1, C2 level, and it's rather a luxury than, uh, the, the, than, than the main, uh, uh, the main content of the lesson. Yeah, this is just some chart to show how you may go about this, that you may, level one would be, for some, some simple text, low-level task, again simple text, more demanding task, low-level task would be just, I don't know, remembering vocab or uh, finding synonyms to the vocab, more demanding task would be writing the essay, rewriting the ending, or something like that. And then difficult test, text, it's always good to start with a low-level task, again vocab usually, collocations, synonyms, find synonyms to these collocations, whatever. Difficult text, more demanding task, again, rewriting or debating it more deeply with, with fellow students. Some last ending notes. Minimize the extent to which the teacher disturbs students' reading. This happens, of course, pre-reading, to, to, to clear it out, clear it out what we are doing, why we are doing it, the vocab, if they have already gone through it. So clear it out beforehand, then let them read it. Don't in interrupt because you wouldn't want to be interrupted while you are reading your, your, your novel. So don't interrupt them while they are reading. Only when you're doing, when you're focusing on pronunciation, so you would correct pronunciation, but it's like only if you're fo focusing on that. And then of course after, but don't disturb them while they are reading. Draw attention to stylistic peculiar, peculiar, peculiarity. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I guess that's clear. If there is something interesting, something peculiar uh, about the specific text, uh, show it to them and say to them like this is I don't know in Bukowski there might be some slang, slang collocation or uh, slang name for something. So you would explain that this is like low, low class American slang and and all. Help students to appreciate the ways the writers use language to achieve particular effects, which is like slightly more advanced, which when you would be like going through the text after they have read it, for example, going through the text after they have read it, which is also good. 
because it's it's hard hard to actually exhaust all the possibilities of the text. So feel free to go to go through it again and to like just comment, discuss it, provide frameworks for creative response. So as as I've mentioned, uh, the rewriting. Yes, what did you enjoy? What did you think about this character? So so ask a lot of these questions. Ask lots of these questions and then let them let let, let it pour out. And some some suggestions I've used. Hemingway's like Hemingway's like the go-to writer here because it's just famously simple language. Non-vulgar poems of Bukowski, yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to get like overexcited, of course, <laughs> about stuff. But Bukowski is like chick chick people love Bukowski, and he's just extremely simple poems and very relatable, very just da daily life, the gutter, whatever. So appropriate non-vulgar poems of Bukowski, Maya Angelou, for example, Nick Hornby, very readable. So some short stories by Nick Hornby, fairy tales that that would be more for like A twos, B ones, maybe, uh, because everybody's probably ha have used some videos about fairy tales. So br bring some gr Grimm Brothers fairy tale, whatever, proverbs, toasts, quotations, whatever is interesting and helps the listen. Thank you.